This time on the show, Time Division Multiplexing, T1s, Robbed Bit Signaling, and Why You Never Actually Got 56K Back in the Day. Yeah. Yeah, hook me up, I'm ready. This episode of Hack 5 is brought to you by GoToAssist Express. Support smarter with GoToAssist Express. Domain.com. Got a great idea? It all starts with a great domain. Domain.com. And Sony. Hello and welcome to Hack 5. My name is Darren Kitchen and this is your weekly dose of Technolust. I've got a great show for you guys this week because we're talking about a topic that is so near and dear to my heart. Something that I've been having a lot of fun with since I was just a little kid. And uh, I thought I'd just share with you guys because, you know, it's the middle of the holidays, I'm doing a lot of traveling. Uh, as this airs, I'm probably still driving across the country, so I guess, you know, follow the Twitter and Facebook for all that action. Maybe I'll even be doing some video blogging. But regardless, uh, putting together a little series here on phone freaking. No, not getting free long distance. We're talking the more interesting intricacies of the telephone network. And you're probably asking yourself, why are we getting into the telephone network? This is a hacker show. Math is hard. You know what? This stuff is fun. It really is. And a lot of it applies to more than just the telephone network. I mean, sure, the free phone calls is kind of an allure, just like the whole packet sniffing thing is. But at the end of the day, it's really learning the network. I mean, don't get me wrong, red boxing was really cool. But when I started learning about the uh, you know, ESS5 and, uh, and DMS100, those are like different switching systems, and then how it all like works with you know T1s and pulse code modulation, time division multiplexing, and you know you just start learning some really really neat stuff that you know a lot of these uh, these topics here apply to more fields than just telephony. So today, I figured, why don't we just go ahead and recap what we talked about last week, and then we're going to get into a little time division multiplexing, and a little bit of the signaling and framing and other fun, cool intricacies of T1s, or what's known as a DS1 circuit, and how that equates to uh, the superior E1, or um, the European version thereof. But yeah, that's what we're doing, dude, and I value your feedback. So throughout all of this, go ahead and hit up feedback at hack5.org. Let me know if this is something you guys like, uh, you know, just like I did with the, uh, what is it, uh, DNS segment, having a lot of fun with the whiteboard. I figured, hey, let's try something completely off the wall with Hack5 and, uh, and see how that goes. But you know, it's uh, your guys' show, so you let me know what you think and uh, we'll make it happen. Of course, I haven't seen any of the feedback of the last week because this is all getting shot back to back and I'm in transit across the country at the moment, but you know, that is what's going on. If you're wondering about the wine, it's so that I can pause and take a drink, because if I don't, I'm going to ramble for the entire show. So, let's paint a little picture here. That's why I've got the markers, right? We got, uh, we got some grassy fields going on, right? Okay, and over here we got some grass going on. Oh, what's that behind the grass? Oh no, it's a big building! And it's got a big logo on it, and it is poorly drawn, but that right there is supposed to be a bell. Anyway, it's Ma Bell. Well, actually, I guess these days it would look more like that. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, when I grew up, it was all Bell Atlantic before they merged with GTE and everybody else to create uh, Verizon, but whatever. Anyway, we got this central office chilling over here, and uh, you know, and, and it's a beautiful day. We got some birds flying over here, and then, oh, what's this? Oh no, it's my house. That's, that's totally where I live, right there, right? And inside my house, I have a telephone, and I wanna call Shannon, because that's what I do on my landline. It's gonna be awesome, right? So we got some telephone poles here. And uh, you probably didn't tune in to watch me draw, so I promise that we're getting to something that uh, makes sense here in a moment. Uh, so we got some telephone cables here, and I'm just gonna I'm gonna be the blue house. So I got I got my two wires going over to the telephone company, right? And we put another one on the other side. Oh wow, look how look how sexy that looks, right? Well then, you know, I've got a next door neighbor here. We're gonna uh, we're gonna call him Mark, right? Mark, Mark lives next door. He's, he's a cool guy, you know. Plays his music a little too loud sometimes, but you can't fault the guy, you know. I'd probably own him in rock band anyway, right? So Mark's got, you know, Mark likes to talk on the phone too, so he's got a circuit, which consists of two, uh, two wires, right? That would be uh, your tip and your ring 
or in the uh, interior of your house telephone wiring, you probably notice them as the red and the green. There may also be a black and a yellow for a second line, but regardless. So we got, you know, we got four wires going over the phone company, but you know, I forget to mention this. I actually live in a big neighborhood right back here. Purple house. Uh, that's Bob. Bob's pretty cool. Bob's got the purple wires all going to the central office. There's something wrong with this picture. Okay. That's never going to work. Cause you can see if we just keep going, you know, for the size of your city, your neighborhood, whatever, this, uh, <laughs> this central office is just going to get completely exhausted with all of those cables going across, you know, your, your telephone poles are going to be like drooping down with gigantic cables. It's not going to work. So what we're going to talk about today is how we take all of those and using a technology called time division multiplexing, rather than sending out, you know, for our example, we're going to be talking about 24 subscribers or 24 households, 24 you know, lines, DS zeros, whatever you want to call them, right? And putting those on to two twisted pairs or four wires on a T1 or what's known as a DS1. And that's what we're going to be getting in today. But how did we get here, right? We're going to be talking about how we can multiplex them digitally. And as you know, from last week, we were talking about pulse amplitude modulation and pulse code modulation and that is essentially taking an analog waveform we got that analog waveform of me talking on the phone right there and we're going to quantize it we're going to say hey that right there is uh, 255 that right there is zero I guess the center line would be 128 um, and then we're going to sample it we're going to sample it 8,000 times every second and we're going to just put these little orange markers here to signify the samples uh, our sample rate of 8,000 Hertz is actually due to the fact that the telephone wire analog is 8 hertz or 8 kilohertz so you have to sample it twice as much anyway regardless we're sampling it a whole bunch and we've talked about how those different sample rates equate to you know things where we, we see pulse code modulation and other technologies such as the compact disc where it's 44.1 kilohertz uh, or DVDs where it's 48 kilohertz or even you know blu-ray where it's one, uh, 192 max I think anyway so the fidelity is all right, you know, if it's 8,000 hertz, 8,000 times a second, we're going to sample that and come up with a number representing this, you know, analog blue waveform here between 0 and 255, which comes out to a 8-bit number. That's the pulse amplitude modulation bit there is coming up with that number. So, for example, in last week we talked about how this one right here might be uh, 173. And then with pulse code modulation, or at least the uh, U-Law version that encompasses North America and Japan, we're going to come up with a binary bit stream. We're going to say, hey, 173, that is equal to 10101101. And we come up with that because binary, going from right to left, can be drawn as 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16 plus 32 plus 64 plus 128 right if you add all of those up together you get 255 of course you start with zero when you're counting a binary math so really you've got 256 you know bits there to work with and that right there is your bit depth right and we we get this by saying okay 173 we can come up with that if we do you know going from the right it's one, the, zero, the, the one indicates that you add, uh, the zero indicates that you ignore and go to the next number essentially. All right, so we've got this one, zero, so we don't add the two. Uh, one, we add the four, we add the eight, zero, we don't add the 16, one, we add the 32, zero, we don't add the 64, and one at the very beginning, uh, we add the 128, which is how we get 100. 73. So essentially what we get is this 10101101 out of, you know, that one eight thousandths, eight thousandths, I, I can't say that. Anyway, <laughs> one of those 8,000 hertz samples, we're going to come up with a binary representation of this analog waveform and it's going to look like this, 10101101, right? And then on the wire we talked about how that is going to look uh, quite gorgeous like this, it's going to look like uh, 1, 0, 1, 0, uh, 1, 1, 0, 1. And that's because this right here is plus 3 volts, that right there is 0 volts, and that right there is minus 3 volts. 
and we alternate those just so that that signal can travel further. And these are really what are known as pulses. Each of these plus three, minus three, that's a pulse. When it's, when it's zero volts, it's nothing. And then what happens is over time, that signal every 6,000 feet is gonna to need to be what's known as regenerated. Rather just in the analog world to amplify it, which would result in noise, we just say, hey, whatever you gave me, it might not be plus three, it might only be like plus two and a half, but I know that that was meant to be a three, and it just recreates that digital signal all over again, and that's how we can maintain a pristine digital connection in what we know as the last mile. Before it gets over to the telephone company and then you know, they shoot it up over a satellite or over a T1 or over many different types of mediums like microwave or underground or undersea cables. Uh, they're probably going to be cut by the CIA anyway. Um, and, and we can, you know, use those so that we can have a conversation without losing quality. And, uh, and that right there in a nutshell is pulse amplitude modulation, pulse code modulation. Wow, okay, a little heavier than I thought on the A block, but you know, I think that was a good recap, and I think we have the fundamentals now to go ahead and start talking about how we can multiplex these, and then get into the, some of the more fun intricacies of T1 circuits, but I guess you guys probably need a break. So do I. So let's just go ahead and kick it over to Shannon, find out about trivia, and when we get back, it's TDM. Last week's trivia question was, Created by Larry Ewing in 1996, this aquatic flightless bird is mascot to what family of Unix-like operating systems? All right, I'll give you a hint. Like a penguin. Get it? Tux! Tux the penguin! He's so cute! I wish he was RL so I could like walk around with him and he could be my little friend. Oh, yeah, anyway. If you want to win some Hack5 swag this week, go over to hack5.org slash trivia and answer the following question. With an initial release of May 2003, this fork of Cafe Log has been downloaded over 12 million times and is used by over 12% of the top million websites. Hmm. We'll be right back after a brief word from our sponsor. Hey, you want to talk about it? No. Come on, I'm listening. I just feel really bad about letting you burn. What? You waste my ear? I, I just didn't want you to make the wrong decision about your web hosting. It's okay. Islandwithdomain.com. They have hosting plans starting at just five dollars and seventy-five cents a month. And the Hack Five viewers get an extra fifteen percent off when they check out with coupon code Hack Five. So what are you making there? Well, I'm making apology soup for you. What's in it? Well. So far, just onions. Domain registration and hosting is nothing to cry over. With Domain.com, hosting plans start at just $5.75 a month, and their deluxe offering includes unlimited bandwidth and site builder pages. See how easy it is to get dependable, flexible, and affordable hosting at Domain.com. Check out with coupon code HAK5 and save an additional 15%. Got a great idea? It all starts with a great domain. Domain.com. Time division multiplexing, it's one of the easiest ones to explain and maybe in a later segment we'll talk about some other ones like frequency division multiplexing and um, wave division multiplexing and a whole bunch of other fun ones when you get into different types of uh, signals like, I don't know, um, fiber optic for example, that's a really fun one. But let's just talk about time division multiplexing because it's really important. As we talked about, we had all of those different homes, you know, my place and, and uh, Frank's place and Mark's place and the whole neighborhood. Say like we got 24 people up in this neighborhood and we all want to get our circuit over to the central office without causing those, uh, those lines to droop. So the phone company said, hey, why don't we save some copper? using some cool technology called time division multiplexing, we'll take all of those digital sources that we've just created using pulse code modulation, and we're gonna stick them all on one line. Yes, that is a T1. Actually, it's not exactly one line, it's really two twisted pairs or four wires, but whatever, right? So T1, it's kind of synonymous to a DS1, or a uh, digital signal one, and Really, the, the difference there is that uh, a DS1 is basically the logical, logical bit pattern of a T1, but really, whenever you see them, they're one and the same. Well, a T1 is just a really cool line that has 24 channels, you can think of them as, and each of those channels is a DS0. 
You'll also see things like a DS3 or a T3 that you may be familiar with as well, uh, which has, you know, I don't remember how many channels. I think it's like 54, but I'm not positive. Anyway, we're talking about a T1, which is 24 channels. Now, let's go ahead and break this down. I'm going to go ahead and paint these, uh, this neighborhood here, and we're just going to use three subscribers just to uh, make it all fit. But here we go. I'll be blue. There is my analog waveform. And uh, here's Bob, and here's his analog waveform, and here's, I don't know, Mark, here's his analog waveform. And each of those, traveling over their you know, individual pairs of wires, they're going to go into a cool little box down the street. And that's going to do what's known as pulse code modulation. Pulse amplitude modulation being a part of that. We've talked about it before, and that's how we end up with just as we talked about, this cool digital representation of those. So I'll paint the rest of that. Okay, so imagine those being 24 subscribers. We've created digital versions of those by sampling them 8,000 times per second or 8,000 hertz. And we've got a bit depth of eight bits, right? So what does that give us? Well, 8 times 8,000, we're going to get times, we're going to get 64,000, 64K bits per second. That's how much bandwidth each of those subscriber lines or DS0 circuits have. So that right there equals 64 kilobits per second, right? Now, we know that that T1, or the DS1, is 24 channels, yet it actually has the bandwidth of 1.544 megabits per second. Now, how do we get that? Okay, before we even get to the whole multiplexing part, how do we get that? Because we know that essentially all we're going to do is we're going to take these, we're going to run them through Another box here, in this case, that box is going to be called Time Division Multiplexing, right? Uh, so we'll come back to this in just a second, but how do we get to 1.544 megabits per second? Well, if you do the math, the, uh, the 24, and remember this, this right here is 24 channels. If we take, the, uh, if we take 8 bits, times 24 channels, right, we get 192. Now, 192 times, remember, 8,000 times per second, or 8,000 hertz, equals 1,536,000, okay? Or 1.536 megabits a second. What's that? It's not 1.544. It's actually because there's another bit in here. Let's just go ahead and add this guy right there. And that's plus one as a framing bit or a timing bit. It's an important bit that maintains our signaling. And that right there brings this, whoops, I'm sorry. That plus one is in the wrong place. <laughs> that plus one is actually right here. Plus one, right? So that's actually 190 three times 8,000, and that's how we get 154, whoops, wrong color. Bear with me. 1544002. Okay, awesome. Too many zeros. Anyway, I think so. No, I had it right the first time. Anyway. That's how we get 1.544, and we're going to come back to that plus one later on in the show because it's really important, and then there are some fun discrepancies that are just going to have you going, whoa, at the end of the show. But that aside, let's now get all of these guys onto one line. How are we going to do that? Okay, well, we're going through the time division multiplexer, and essentially what it's going to do is it's going to say, hey, you know, this, this is sampled you know, for each of these are sampled 8,000 times per second, that means 
that each of these uh, sequences, a sequence of eight bits in a byte, is going to take about, you know, find the right color here, is going to take about 125 microseconds. Okay? 125 microseconds, because it's 8,000 times per second, right? Now, what we're going to need to do is to put all of those on one, except we're going to have to compress it down. Now, we're not actually speeding up the bits. You can't speed up bits. It's copper wire. It's not going to happen. You're not going to be able to send electricity faster on a T1 than you would on a DS0 or a subscriber line. It's, it's no different. Sorry, we just can't bend the rules there. But what we can do is increase the rate, because this 125 microseconds is the rate of 8,000 hertz or 8,000 times a second for our 8 bits on our single DS0, our single subscriber. But what happens here is when we go to time division multiplexing, we're going to say, hey, we're going to actually come up with discrete time slots, okay? And each of these time slots are going to be, if we divide that by 24, we're going to get 5.2 microseconds, right? So right here where we had this really big, you know, pretend that's 8 bits, right? We're going to, on our stream here, we're going to say, okay, yeah, mm-hmm, right? Pretend that's 8 bits, right? Squish down, right? And we're going to say, okay, cool. So we've got our 8 bits for the blue one, Darren, the first subscriber. And then we're going to go to Joe, and, and Joe needs to get his bits in as well. So we're going to send Joe's bits, right? And then we're going to go down to, to Mark, and we're going to send Mark's bits. And just imagine that those are eight times each, right? And, uh, and, and rather than three, we're actually talking about 24, but I just don't have enough whiteboard for that. But so after we've done 24 of these, we've got one more bit, just a single bit, not eight, right? And that is going to be, that's going to be our timing the bit that we talked about, our, our one bit that adds, you know, that, that makes that 192 193 that we can maintain timing and that's important because what we need to do is every time we see that we're going to need to know okay great the next eight bits is for channel one the next eight bits after that is for channel two channel three all the way to 24 and then we see the timing bit again okay and that's how rather than 1.536 it's 1.544 so each of these being 52 microseconds versus when they were up here being 125 microseconds, you can see how we've just increased the sample rate, increased the rate here for our T1, and we can take 24 subscribers and put them on one wire, right? We just sequence them with time division multiplexing. We've got those time slots, we put them all into it, and everything's sitting happy as long as we've got that timing bit so that we know when to be counting each channel or time slot. Now, just anecdotally, and not with a whole lot of specification here, how does that compare to our European counterparts? Well, they were a bit smarter than us, if you ask me. They have what's known as an E1, and I don't know all of the nitty gritties of those because, you know, being an American and all that, but what I do know is theirs is 32 Love how that's a nice uh, round number, if you will. 32 time slots, right? I forget the exact bandwidth of it, too. But uh, they have separate bandwidth dedicated to signaling and timing. And when we get back, we're going to be talking about how T1 signaling works. And all of a sudden, you're going to get really jealous of the Europeans. And you can understand why sometimes you couldn't get much more than 33.6 on your 56K modem back in the day when you were a little HPB playing Quake 2. I know, we all remember. Now, before we get going though, I do want to say, hey, thank you so much to our latest sponsor, Sony. Our friend over at Bike Jacker, Jacker Anthony Carboni, actually put together a little mini segment for us, and we're gonna air it now, and we would really like to know what you think of it. So, check this out. 
Hey guys, Anthony here for Signal by Sony, a show about everything Sony makes, from gear to games to movies, and I've been wondering just how realistic Gran Turismo 5 is. So I grabbed a professional race driver and brought him here to Venice, California and the GT Studios. We're going to have him play the game and compare its track to the real track. Uh, are you feeling slight changes as you're as you're hitting up against walls? Well, and stuff? you know, I didn't I didn't hit hard enough, so it might just be cosmetic at this point. But I think that's important because before we all know there was absolutely no damage in the game, and now, I mean, cosmetic is one thing, but more importantly is how does the car drive after you've hit the wall or have you hit somebody else? Because that has consequences, and if you don't realize those consequences, then people just don't really take it seriously. And that's just some of the stuff we did here at GT Studios. To find out more about Gran Turismo 5, head to revision3.com slash Sony. So by now we have a general understanding of how we can take something from analog to digital with pulse amplitude modulation and pulse code modulation, and then how we can multiplex it with 23 other subscribers on a 24 channel T1 or a DS1 link using time division multiplexing. And I figured that T1 link, it's kind of interesting. It's got some interesting bits that, hey, you know, they're still, they're still around, they're still kicking, you'll see them a lot. Why don't we learn some of the finer details of it, just a few that I find really interesting uh, as far as the signaling is concerned. Because like we said, and let's just go ahead and, and paint out a, uh, an idea here of a multiplexed T1. So again, blue being Darren, we've got, uh, we've got a binary bit stream here. I'm just going to do the 8-bit. Okay, so there's, uh, there's me, and then we've got you know, the next subscriber. Just a few bits here, no particular order. The next subscriber. And then let's imagine 21 other subscribers. And then we have a one. And that right there is, uh, that color is not working out so well. We have a one. And that right there is our signal bit, our timing bit. It helps us understand where the channels begin and it happens every 193 bits because there's eight of these times 24, 192, plus that 193 times 8,000, was it 8,000? Yeah, no, times 24, no, I just did my math wrong. Times that number, yes, times 8,000, and that's how we get 1.544 megabits per second. Sorry, had a little moment there. Anyway, what I think is really interesting, at least in the American T1, is a little thing called robbed bit signaling. Now signaling equipment needs more bandwidth than what is available here. Sure, we've got that one you know, framing bit there, but we need a little bit more. And what they end up doing is every sixth subscriber, see how we had a eight bit here? Pretend like this green one here was actually the sixth subscriber. What they would do is they're actually gonna take that last bit, that eighth bit there, and they're gonna use it. They're so greedy, they're gonna use it for themselves. So what does that mean? Well, if every sixth subscriber on a T1 is only getting seven of their eight bits, that means that you have a, uh, you know, only a, a five and six chance of getting all eight bits, right? Now, what do those come out to? Well, your eight bits times 8,000 times per second, or 8,000 hertz, we know to be 64 kilobits per second, which in pulse code modulation actually equates to 37 decibels, or I guess that's supposed to be a big B, or is it supposed to be a big D? Hmm, I'm just gonna go lowercase. Decibels signal to noise ratio, okay? So that's kind of your audio fidelity you can kind of think of that as, right? Well, if we're that sixth subscriber, we're only going to get seven bits. Now that's not a that's not a big deal. We can still send you know our data there. That just means that our our bit depth is only going to be seven. So rather than uh, going to 256 or two well to two you know counting the zero 255, um, what does that go up to 128 then? Hmm. Yeah, something like that. Anyway, we're not going to get quite as much uh, fidelity there. So seven bits times 8,000 hertz equals 56 kilobits per second or 31 decibels signal to noise ratio. Hey, 
Remember those days, 56K? There you go, and that's why, or it's one of the reasons. Uh, and I think that there's, there, what's really interesting about this is, okay, so we've got this timing bit over here on our T1 that says, hey, um, you know, you see me, I'm a one, I'm the timing bit. That means that the next eight bits are going to be, you know, channel one and then channel two, three, four, etc. And then, you know, depending on our signaling equipment, we may, you know, rob the eighth bit every uh, six channels, right? It's one of the ways to do it. Uh, and there's various methods of signaling, but that's one of them, right? The, the robbed bit signaling. Uh, we're going to make every six subscriber only seven bits, right? 56K, huh? Bummer to be you. Well, that timing bit there isn't a constant in the universe. It's not like hooked up to some crazy atomic clock or anything. It's just arbitrarily set for that T1 or that DS1 link, right? Well, when you make a phone call, say like, you know, you're in Poughkeepsie and you want to call uh, Waynesville, Missouri, you might go through several T1s. And not all of those T1s are synchronized, which means if they all use robbed bit signaling, not only do you have a greater chance of having your eighth bit robbed, but you could be robbed more than once, which means that your call quality could really degrade, which means your dial-up uh, quality, if you're calling to another city, could really degrade. How many of you guys didn't always connect at 56 kilobits a second? Yeah, I know. I remember. I'd always get like 33.6 or sometimes 26 something if it was like, you know, calling a different city far away or whatever. Uh, that was a real shame, right? And I just find that to be one of those fascinating little intricacies here of the T1. A few other things that I can't go into a whole lot of detail due to time about T1s though, is, you know, we talked about the, uh, the European version, the E1. Well, they have 32 channels, right? And they actually have separate bandwidth for their signaling, so they don't rob any bits, right? Well, there's a few other interesting things about the American thing, the T1 and that is one's density. And what one's density says is that at least one of the bits for every byte, for every eight bits, right, has to be a one. So you can't have, you can't have eight, six, uh, eight zeros in a row. It's gotta be, you know, you get to here and then it has to be a one. Actually, has to be a one, right? And uh, that means that you've got a 12 and a half uh, percent ones density. And I just, I find that quite interesting as well as one other little key thing here about T1. And that's what's known as B8ZS. That's supposed to be a Z. So what is B8ZS? It actually stands for bipolar with eight zero substitution. And essentially what that does is if there is a string of eight or more zeros, it actually replaces it with a, a special string. And of course it's going to reverse it on the other end because it knows that special string. But it's, I just find it fascinating that there are these like, you know, intricate rules when we're talking about T1 signaling that we don't have to think about you know, when we're, we're talking about our fun, you know, our TCP stuff. Uh, and the other thing that I found that was interesting when I was uh, picking up some of this research that I really hadn't touched since I was like 13, um, is that there's actually like silence on a line is represented as all ones. I know, that's, that's math, that's something you can take home to grandma or something. <laughs> You guys are really going to need to send some feedback on this particular segment or this series, if you will, because uh, I'm fascinated to hear what you guys think about these discussions. Uh, I know that it's not very uh, practical in the sense that we're talking about how to, you know, you know, do such and such with backtrack for or whatever. But, uh, you know, if this is something you enjoy, definitely hit us up, feedback at hack5.org. I'd love to hear what you guys think. And, dude, if you were, like, hanging out in Pound Freaks or pound uh, 2600 on, you know, irc.dal.net back in the 90s, you remember Ardwolf, dude, you know, give me a ring. 
pull my docks, whatever. I mean, come on. We, um, yeah, our paths probably crossed. And, you know, it's fun to revisit some of this old school freak stuff that's not necessarily just exploiting the telephone system. It's, it's really just getting intimate with the technology and having a deeper understanding of it. And in this case, the PSTN, but, you know, time division multiplexing, you will see in so many other areas. And maybe if this is something you guys are interested in seeing more of, we can talk about other types of multiplexing, other types of signaling, and get into more fun electronic stuff. It's really up to you guys. Hit us up. And uh, with all of that said, whew, I think we need to take a break. And when we get back, Shannon's going to help us wrap it all up. As many of you know, I do a lot of IT consulting and I've been using GoToAssist Express exclusively for the last six months. Now, I've fallen in love with this software and the last time we talked about how you can easily reboot a computer, instantly get connected to a computer and transfer files, I figured I would tell you about some of my other favorite features. For example, diagnostics. In just one click, I can get a glance at a computer and understand all the applications that are installed, the processes, the system setup, the devices, what services are going on, what Microsoft Office stuff is installed. It's a real simple way to just glance at a machine and have an understanding of what's going on. Also, another neat feature is the screen sharing. Now, you might imagine, okay, it's remote support. Of course, you can share the screen. You can control their keyboard and mouse, right? But it also can work in reverse, which is great, for example, if you have an application on your desktop that you would like to show them. It's awesome for training in that sense. Now, another thing that I really love, and it might seem really simple, is chat. I've been in situations where I've been tethered to my cell phone for a 3G connection to get remote support done while on the road. And obviously I couldn't be on the phone and using the 3G at the same time. So the chat feature is really nice rather than you know making do with like what opening a notepad document and going back and forth or something. The, also the really cool key about the chat there is, and I've used this before on like, I don't know, the aftermath of a bad patch Tuesday or something, is the ability to do multiple clients at the same time. Yeah, that's, I can have as many of these support sessions running as I want and I can just tab between them, which is really nice when it comes to the chat to just have an idea of what I'm doing with which client and using the notes feature to make comments about each of those clients and what issues they're having so that I can get those solved quickly. You know, that's what GoToAssist Express is all about. They put the tools at your fingertips to get the job done quickly and easily so you can spend the rest of your time doing more important things. And it's definitely gonna cut down on travel costs and, and all those terrible expenses and, and the time involved in all that. So I definitely love it and I highly encourage you guys to check it out. You can get a free 30-day trial if you go to gotoassist.com slash hack5. Now for that special offer though, you do have to use that URL. Again, that's gotoassist.com slash hak5. If you've got the Technoless like Aaron who made his server tower and very nicely named it the Learning Lab, make sure to email your photos over to feedback at hack5.org. And if you have a favorite hacker in your family, make sure to go over to hack5.org slash store and find them the perfect present for the holidays. And last but not least, you can support your favorite podcast by subscribing over at iTunes and YouTube. It's very, very simple. Make sure you guys do it. Until next week, I'm Shannon Morse. Remember to trust your Technolust. Yay! It is freezing in here. Man, I'm gonna go light a fire. Woo! If you've got the technolust like Aaron who sent us a photo of his, 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 his.